wave them a little bit. It's just a way of saying thanks to the Lord for this book. Turn, if you will, to the last book in the Bible. The Revelation. Don't put an S on that. The Revelation. Singular. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 12. And I call your attention to verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. How many know who the dragon is? Tell me. Satan, the devil, right. Notice that Michael, who was an archangel, had angels under him, and he led them to battle against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon had angels under him. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, keep your Bible handy because we're going to use it here for just a moment. Turn back in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. Every time I say that word, I think of something to eat. I don't know why. Deuteronomy. It just sounds like you ought to cook it. I don't know. And in the 11th chapter... Let's just read one verse. Uh, the 11th chapter has to do with the importance of heeding the Word of God. And verse 16 sort of capitalizes the whole thing. Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Now, let's go clear back to the New Testament and in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. And mark the following verses. I'll read, first of all, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Mark that. Then verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall, and mark this, shall deceive many. Then in verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall, mark this, deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. And then look at verse 15. I'm sorry, look at verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Beautiful to hear the pages turn, as long as it doesn't take too long. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, 
verse 33. Mark this. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Be careful who you run with. That's what he's really saying. In 2 Corinthians the second letter, and in the eleventh chapter, follow with me as I read, beginning with verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let's go to one more. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. The middle of a sentence that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. I want to talk to us for just a few minutes about five ways Satan deceives us. Five ways Satan deceives us. Now keep your Bible handy. In Genesis chapter 3, this is one time that I'm preaching the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In the third chapter of the book of Genesis, just two verses will pick up the thought. Verse 4 and 5. Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5. And the serpent, that's Satan, the devil, said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Now, Turn back, we're using the word good today, turn back to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 14, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 14. That's not correct. Turn to 1 Timothy 2, verse 14. Whoever it was here that wrote my notes. That was me. Verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Now I'm talking about five ways Satan deceives us. Here's the first one. Satan deceives us when we are tempted to disobey God's word or when we doubt what God says. The moment that happens, we're deceived. And it happens to us more than we realize particularly if we're in a test or in a trial, it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult 
to say it and really mean it. Don't worry, God's in control. How many have ever said that and then just worried yourself sick? How many have said, oh, don't have anything to worry about. Steps of a good man, order the Lord, everything's going to be all right. Then stay up all night. You see, it's a lot easier to doubt than it is to believe when the circumstances run opposite to the promise. And we are all exercised in that because it's the only way God can strengthen faith. It's the only way he can strengthen faith is to exercise us concerning his word and his promise. We all know that the more we exercise, the stronger our body stays. And so they tell, and they tell you, especially as you get older, exercise. And the older you get, the less you want to do it. Exercise? No. But God exercises us by giving us a promise and then running us into a circumstance where the circumstance is opposite to the promise. And we have a tendency to believe the circumstance rather than the promise. Now, I want to say something, and I'll be misunderstood, but uh, you'll just have to take it for what it's worth. I want you to notice, and this is no reflection against women, but I want to make a spiritual truth that is very, very important that we understand. Adam was not deceived. The woman was. And the reason that Satan made his attack on the woman is because the woman in most cases is stronger than the man. A woman, a wife, boy do I have your attention. <laughs> a wife can influence her husband almost any way she wants to. And if we'll be honest, there's power in a woman. So this is not an insult to a woman. This is recognizing the authority a woman has and the weakness that a man has. If you all understood that, say amen. amen. Now, if you're mad about it, don't say a word to me. <laughs> but there's a serious warning connected with it. Women, be careful how you influence your man. Because he's going to react according to your spirit. Rare is the man that can stand against his wife even when she's wrong. And Satan knew that right in the beginning. And he went to the woman. And it was the woman with her influence that caused Adam to make a decision in rebellion when he knew what he was doing. He was not deceived. And all the people said, And women, with that great power that God has given you, because you see, you were taken out of the very heart of man, and God has given you tremendous authority under authority. The man's the head, but you're the neck. See, that went over like a lead balloon. I could take you through the scripture and show you reference after reference where it's true. 
but time won't permit it now. Here's the second way Satan deceives us. By getting us to trust in ourselves. I can handle this. I'll figure it out. This is what I'll do. Uh, how did your granddaughter do? Did New York win? Did they? You, you don't even know. You don't know as much as I know. I watched the whole first half of that thing. Huh? I know. Did she win or lose? You thought she won. He doesn't know. He just his granddaughter. So he, he, he believes that she won even if she lost. Turn, turn, turn to the Psalms. And, and I, I want you to look, if you will, start with Psalm 20. And listen to this carefully. Verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But David said, I'm going to put my trust in God. You see, you only use horses and chariots when you face a battle. If there's no battle, you don't need horses and chariots. And if we trust in the horses and the chariots rather than in God, we're going to lose the battle. David's great sin, you're going to say it's Bathsheba. No, it wasn't. David's great sin was when he numbered Israel. And he said to his captain, I want you to find out how many soldiers we've got, how many horses, how many chariots, how much strength have we got to go against the Philistines. And God thundered out of heaven and said, David, you've just sinned and you've blasphemed against me because instead of you putting your trust in me, when I told you to let me fight your battle for you, you lean to your army and your horses and your chariot and I'm displeased and I'm going to take the kingdom away from you because you did not trust in me. That was the sin that destroyed him. And you and I are faced with that all the time, with situations where we are going to interject our horses and our chariots and our army, and God says, okay, if you're going to do it with your army and with your chariots and with your horses, you go on. You don't have my help. Look in, in Psalm 25, verse 2. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Why? Because he trusted in God. Look at Psalm 31 and verse 6. Listen to it. I have hated those who regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Look at the Psalm 55. And by the way, I just picked out a few. This Bible is pregnant with it. Look in verse 21 of chapter 55. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they like drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved, but thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Oh, let's look at 56, Psalm 56, you're right there close. Look at verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they are many that fight against me. O thou most high, when I am afraid, I will what? Trust in thee. Let's look at one more over in the 143rd Psalm. Listen, David uttered these words starting with verse 8. 
Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. Let's don't trust in our ability. Let's don't trust in our manipulation. Let's don't trust in the arm of flesh. Let's don't trust in our ways. Let's don't trust in our reasoning. Let's say to the Lord, Lord, I trust thee. If the devil can get any of us to lean on the arm of flesh, he has deceived us, for the arm of flesh can make us believe that as Christians we should not have to suffer. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I will quote to you what James said. Count it all joy, brethren. When the test comes, count it joy. Because if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. The power of the resurrection and the fellowship of suffering go together. Someone says, oh, Brother Pano, we're, 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 we're suffering. We're hurting. Sure we are. You say, is God in this? God has never promised that we would be excluded from it. It's in suffering that Paul said when he wrote to Timothy, it's in suffering that God strengthens and establishes and settles us. Suffering is the instrument that God uses. The one time that Jesus rebuked Peter was when Peter said, Lord, you're not going to suffer. I'll see to it. And the Lord said, you don't know what you're talking about, Peter. And in Cornfield, Indiana language, he said, you shut up. Because this is the will of the Father. On the other occasion, Peter said, I'll weigh out your suffering. And whatever the weight of the suffering is, I'll give you the same weight of glory. Don't let the devil tell you that if everything, if God's got his way, everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's not. If God has his way, he'll lead us through the valley. He'll take us through the dark place. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's in the valley that we prove the love and the peace of God. Don't let the devil tell you you're all off base if you're suffering. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, For ye are hereto appointed to suffer, that ye may learn to comfort others that are suffering. So, Brother Pino, are, are we suffering in the church? Yes. If you're not hurting, it's because you're not very close. Hurt, suffer, pain, anguish, torment. Is God in that? Yes. Is He going to leave us there? No. But He's going to work out His purpose and then bring us out. Because it is His will that we know the fellowship of suffering before we know the power of resurrection. Amen. Now here's the fourth one. We're deceived if we think money and things are the key to happiness. We live in a materialistic world 
where we are absolutely duped and fooled by the style setters. We can have a perfectly wonderful suit of clothes that's got narrow lapels. <coughs> and then they'll come out with big ones to intimidate you, to throw away your good suit with the narrow lapels. One minute you got a necktie, looks like this. That's it. Six months later, the stylus come out and it looks like this. <laughs> Say, well, I'm not caught up in it. We all are. About the time the women get used to wearing, then they go here. You know why? Because they're taken. You know, I lost me. Yeah, you lost me. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> things, things, things. Until God said it so strongly. He said, the one thing that's in competition with me is mammon, and that's money and things. He said, You're, if you don't make me God, you make this God. And if you make that God, then I'm not God. We both can't be God. You can't serve mammon and me at the same time. And we think, oh, I've got to have this. If I can just get this, it'll make me happy. I have been 60 years gathering things. Now I'm doing everything in the world to get rid of it, and nobody wants it. <laughs> Say, to make you happy? Some things I've had back, didn't even know I had it. How could it make me happy? Didn't even know I had it. Lost track of it years ago. Things, 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 things. Now, here's the fifth one. Before I leave the fourth one, don't think that you can attain thing and then reach happiness because when you get whatever the thing is, the thing won't make you happy. Then it'll be something else. Or someone's got a thing like yours, only it's better than your thing. I bought a computer. Tried to give it to my grandson. He didn't want it. Because the new ones are better than the one you've got, Papa. <laughs> Only six months. Say, why do you want him to have it? Because I don't know how to run it. <laughs> now there's one more. And I want you to listen. He deceives us when he tries to convince us that our situation and circumstances is so bad and our relationship with some people is so bad that we can't forgive. So we don't. There is nobody that has done anything to any of us that we can't forgive if we want to. I want to say that again. There is nobody that's done anything that is so bad that we can't forgive if we want to. Because if we don't, now, I want, I want you to turn, and I'll close with this one. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I won't go into detail except to tell you there was a man in the church at Corinth that was doing an, an abominable thing. When he was rebuked, the fear of the Lord came on him and he repented. And Paul writes back to the church and he writes these words. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He said concerning that man, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted by the many. He said, you as a congregation cause this man to pay a price for his wretchedness. You put the pressure on him and, 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 and you, you exposed him and, and you made him everything that he was and in that process he repented. He quit. So in verse 7 he says, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive him and to comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Listen carefully. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Now let me say six things and I'll close. What unforgiveness will do, I want to go back to my statement, there is nothing that anybody can do to any of us that we can't forgive if we choose to. Did you catch it on TV on ABC News where the woman met with the, I think it was the granddaughter or one of the relatives of the little girls that were killed in the bombing in Atlanta and this one daughter who was the granddaughter of the accused bomber and they met in ABC and the granddaughter whose grandfather was a part of killing those girls said to this beautiful black lady, he said, she said, I, I want to say it publicly and nationally I want to get on TV and tell you that for our family we are sorry I'm sorry that my grandfather had anything to do with this and I knew that black lady was a Christian because how many anyone else see it beside me good okay then you know that black lady looked at her with all the tenderness and she said thank you You've helped us to bring closure to this. You are forgiven for murdering my, who was it? Granddaughter? Granddaughter. You are forgiven. Did you hear, did you hear the man, and I know he was a Christian, that was interviewed on, on CNN where he lost his wife and, and, and a baby in the bombing in Oklahoma City. And the man that was interviewing him said, how do you feel? Do you want to watch McVeigh put to death? And the man made a gracious answer. He says, there are some people that need to watch that for closure. But he said, I don't personally need to watch that because I will not permit Timothy McVeigh to intimidate me. I have forgiven him for his wrong. I think it deserves a hand clap. Now, if you got a pencil, write these six things down and I'll close. What does unforgiveness do? If you'll read the text that I've read and just pay close attention to it, you'll find out it does this. Number one, it produces bitterness. Wherever there is bitterness, there is unforgiveness. Forgiveness releases bitterness. Bitterness, listen to this, bitterness is the poison... I drink hoping it will kill my enemy. Did you get that? I, I think that's powerful. I wrote that down. <laughs> Bitterness is the poison that I drink hoping it will kill my enemy.
Here's the second thing. Unforgiveness divides brethren and Christians. Draws a line. And divides. Splits. That's what unforgive. You say, oh, I've forgiven. Not if there's division. Because when forgiveness predominates, division is gone. There are many references in the Scripture that because strife could not be settled, separation was determined. You say, what's your example? I've got a lot of them. I'll give you one. God had the experience with Lucifer. There was no reconciliation, so all that was left was separation. And we either come to forgiveness or to separation. That's where we are. Number three, unforgiveness fosters anger and builds tension. Unforgiveness fosters anger and builds tension. Contention or tension until you feel like you're pulled up like a rubber band. There's no relaxing. Any moment, something's going to explode. And we tiptoe on the edge of explosion where there's unforgiveness. And we can get so close that it's possible for it to become violent. That's unforgiveness. Number four, unforgiveness is disobedience. Christians do not have an option because the only way we receive God's forgiveness is if we are forgivers. Forgive me, Father, as I forgive those who trespass against me. We can't be the recipients of something that we don't practice. Number five. Unforgiveness gives an open door to Satan in our lives to do what he could never do if we were forgivers. It's saying to Satan, door is open. Do you know that it's a dangerous thing to go to some movies because in some movies you can open yourself up to demon power? Young people, listen to your preacher today. Check with your parents on the movie you're going to go see because the world system is very subtle and there are people that have become demon-possessed watching a movie. Do you know that succumbing to a bad habit will open the door for Satan's devices? Here's the last one. Unforgiveness is contagious. It's a disease. If you have it and you keep it, you're going to contaminate somebody else with it. You'll get off in a corner someplace and you'll tell them. 
until you've got them convinced to believe just exactly what you believe. And when you walk away, instead of one contamination, now there are two. And next thing you know, there are three. Then there are ten. And it's like a contagion of smallpox breaks out. You never know where it's going to manifest itself. That's to leave you with the negative. And I won't do that. Because the opposite of unforgiveness is forgiveness. And forgiveness is a contagion too. And if you forgive, it encourages the next person to forgive. And if they forgive, they infect the next one. And the next thing you know, forgiveness is running rampant in the house. <laughs> Say, where's it going to start? Me, with you, I'm not going to look and say, when are you going to start? Before I came to preach this message, I had to make up my mind. Lord, I'm not going to preach what I don't practice. If I've offended you, I don't know it. If you'll come to me and tell me, I will get on my knees if I need to and ask your forgiveness. I'll do whatever. If you'll just come and tell me, I honestly don't know what I have done. But if you'll tell me, or if God will tell me, I'll be at your door saying, Forgive me. I'm sorry. I need your forgiveness. And it's time that we once again make plans to meet in little bunches. Meet out in the hall and meet in the restroom. And meet in the halls. And let's meet together. Not to talk about divisive things, but to say, Let's forgive one another. Let's love one another. Let's put all of this behind us. And let's get ready for the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost this church has ever seen. I have prayed by the hour before preaching this sermon. I, I don't.